Um, wow. Well, it all came about um, because I guess uh, at one point I was asked for a um, uh, to help out on a particular campaign, which was not uncommon. Um, and I think it had to do with a boiler or something had gone kapui and, and they were looking for some funds to help uh, in the maintenance. And um, my natural instinct has always been, since um, I've been in a fortunate position to be able to help, to say yes. And, and, but in that particular instance, it, it sort of hit me that um, really all I was doing is throwing good money after bad. And, um, you know, we were just sort of the shul where I was not involved at all, uh, was just sort of going from one crisis to another. And I really had no idea what was going on there, except it just seemed to be one crisis for another. <clears throat> and um, I basically said, no, um, that's it. I'm not paying another couple thousand dollars or whatever it was at the time. And thought I was doing the right thing and, and went home that night and uh, thought everything was normal, had dinner and went to bed and instead of thinking about work, <clears throat> all of a sudden I had this sort of knot in my stomach which, uh, which quickly related to the fact that I basically told the shul that I wasn't going to help. And um, that didn't feel right. Um, and I talked a bit about it with Marla and, and I, I, you know, I sort of said, look, uh, to myself that something's got to happen here because, you know, just throwing money at it isn't the answer, but we have to really start to rethink about what's happening with our congregation, with our shul, with our community, and we're going to lose it. It's going to be gone. And that's when I really got sick and um, sort of eventually fell asleep, woke up the next morning and decided in my mind that uh, whether it was possible or not, and I had no idea whether it was, but rather than just sort of donating and trying to fix things on an ad hoc basis, we had to rethink this whole process as what's going on at the shul. And as you recall, that's when I called you and said, we've got a big problem. Um, you said, see you later on the first part of the call. And I said, Wendy, I'm not kidding. Um, she said, what are you talking about? because obviously you had been more involved with the synagogue over the years and the community and I'd been totally checked out. And uh, basically I said, look, I think the shul's in big, big trouble and we're going to lose it. And I said, I don't think we should let that happen. And your initial reaction was, eh, you know, the community's already decided and, and there's other things we have to do and there's bigger issues and, and that decision's probably already been made. And, and I said, I fought back and I said, no, um, I don't think that's the case. And I think it's, we should try to do something about it. And I cannot do it alone. You know for sure I can't do this alone and I need help and I need somebody with a sensibility as to the community needs and what the history of the shul and, and somebody who's been involved and, and um, I'd like you to help me do this. Because I for sure, I'm not, I'm not gonna do it on my own and I can't do it on my own. Um, he sort of looked at me still like I was a little bit crazy and then sort of thought about it and then literally within, I think, the better part of 10 minutes, he looked at me and said, I'm in. And that was the beginning, that was the genesis of how we sort of started this whole um, evolution or revolution as it was at the time. Um, uh, and, and we knew pretty early on in the process that it wasn't going to be easy. Um, we had a really dysfunctional situation here. Um, uh, nobody was showing up, there was very little programming, uh, there were big issues between the old regime and the new regime. Um, we had a rabbi here who some people thought was doing a good job. I looked around and I don't know how you define a good job, nobody was showing up. It was really a mess. And um, you know, people thought it had to do with the building itself and, and we sort of recognized very early it really didn't have anything to do with the building, it had to do with the fact that there was nothing here for people to to, to congregate around or to participate with. So that's when it started and then we laid out the plan. So let's talk about Rabbi Salzberg a little bit. Uh, tell, tell a very brief story of how we found him and uh, what we saw in him and, and how he's fulfilled our, gone beyond fulfilling our Right. Well, that was quite a, a you and I probably 
did something that very few people ever had the opportunity to do. Um, and one of the big problems we had right off the bat was we had to find a new rabbi. Um, Lord knows I've never done that before. I've hired and fired a lot of people, and, but never at that level. And um, so we went to New York, as you recall, and saw a whole bunch of resumes, met a whole bunch of people, had, you know, had a hope that we were going to find somebody, but our expectation was, was, was practical. And, and you know, how are we going to find the right person? Uh, we need somebody young. We need somebody progressive. We need somebody who's going to come to Hamilton. You know, an American that's going to come to Hamilton. How are we going to do this? We were going to tell them it's the suburb of Toronto, or we were going to fool them. You know, um, and it was, you know, it was quite a process. Um, and and we actually didn't find the rabbi on the first run through. There were a couple other solid candidates. Um, you and I had some great meetings down there where you fell asleep in certain meetings, and I had to carry the weight, which was hysterical because uh, I knew precious little of what I was doing, but. Um, could tell that you weren't interested in that particular candidate. Anyway, basically, the, the rabbi, we were really his second or third choice, I think. He was already involved or looking at some other community, and I'll ask you the same question in five minutes, and your memory's probably better than mine as to exactly how it happened. But he got recommended to us. We were sort of, we thought we had somebody else. We brought them up. We introduced them to the community. We had Julia that was here for a while, and, and but we didn't really get comfortable, and then boom, and then we met. Rabbi Dan, and um, basically right from the start, it was love at first sight um, from our perspective, and I think from his too, quite frankly, because you know his background coming from you know a smaller community. They, he went to school in L.A. I think they were both Key and Karen sort of had enough of that whole sort of big city atmosphere. I think the community resonated well, and I also think very early in the process, they saw the opportunity to that we were starting from scratch and that they were going to be able to help us build something. And, and, and there's, you know, I, you know in, in being involved in businesses, one of the big charges I get out of it is when you create something, you start right from the, the beginning and it's yours and you grab ownership. And, and I think they saw that and I think obviously that's why it's working and that's the experience that we have now. This is their home. It's our home. Um, we actually built, I wanted you to come for a walk with me. I guess you're not going to do it because you're nervous. With the jigglings or something, but um, you know, we built a community and then we built a structure here. And I think um, none of this could have happened if we hadn't connected with Rabbi Dan. Um, uh, you know, did I think we were going to get that lucky? No. Were did we? Yes. Um, was it shared? What was it? I don't know. But um, um, you know, the first thing we had to do was find our spiritual leader, and that was Rabbi Dan and Karen. And the kids. How, um, how audacious was it for us to think that we could have created this new show and show? Um, well, it, it's, it's funny. I actually just had a conversation about that with somebody this morning. And, and, you know, initially, a lot of discussion was about, you know, absolutely the wrong thing. When we first started, it was the shul falling apart. Well, that was why I got involved. The boiler or something was falling apart. And, you know, nobody was coming. We had a we had a, a small chapel. We had a big sanctuary. Um, you know, it was like mama bear, papa bear. One was too big. One was too small. The building's falling apart. There's no affinity for the place. The, the truth of the matter is that the, 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 what we what you and I found out early is that the building had nothing to do with anything. It, it had to do with the fact that we had, you know, a big hole in the community. So, the idea was see if we could. The community wanted to start to fill that hole, see if we could offer something. And then if that worked, then maybe we'd have a shot at trying to build something that was more appropriate for the type of community and the type of use that we need here. Um, um, so we were into the project two or three years before we even really seriously considered doing what we ended up doing. Um, when we got a little bit of confidence, when people started to show up again, when you know, it looked like the rabbi was really going to hang around. Um, that, that we sort of said, well, let's take a shot at it. So, you know, we, you and I s sat down and said, how are we going to do this? How much money is it going to take? We had this grandiose plan initially. We we're going to not only try to build a new chapel, we were going to, we were going to redesign the, you know, the, the sanctuary as well. And, and, and then we had to find an architect. Uh, 
um, I've been dealing with this architect in Toronto, uh, Quadrangle is the name of the firm and, and the guy's name is Les Klein and he'd done some work with synagogues in Toronto and some other religious institutions. He's a really good guy. So we're working, struggling. He'd come out and looked at the building and trying to figure out how we could adapt what we've got here to what we need. And, and then he calls me literally at 12 o'clock at night and he says, I got it. I says, what? you got what? Are you sick? He says, no, I got it. He says, what do you got? He says, I figured out how we're going to rebuild your shul. I said, really, at 12 o'clock? He says, yeah, I figured it out. I said, what is it? He says, we're going to do a shul within the shul. I said, what are you talking about, a shul within the shul? He says, no, we're going to do a shul within the shul. You had that old stupid social hall up there that nobody uses, that with the, with the, with the, uh, with the what's it, the pin board stuff in it, whatever it is, the cork boards. Um, he says, you know, the back end of your, where people come in off the parking lot should be a beautiful new entrance. He said, I think what we can do is redesign that whole thing. So you come in, we'll put beautiful new doors there, and then we're going to open it up, walk up a few stairs, and you're going to walk into the social hall. I said, the social hall's not even there. He says, yes, it is. He says, I thought it, I looked on the plans, and what we can do is we can reconvert that space. It looks like a perfect space for the 120 to 150 people, which is the, the size that we need. He had all this planned in his head. He had it all done. And, um, and, and that's how this new beautiful facility started. I said, okay, it sounds like a plan. Draw it up. Let's take a look at it. He got uber excited. We got uber excited. It went through a couple iterations. I, I, visually, it was very hard for us to imagine, all of us, because this is like turning the shul upside down in terms of how you got into it. You know, we have these beautiful entrance on Aberdeen that nobody ever uses, and now we're going to build a beautiful entrance in the back. And it just worked amazing. And um, uh, we, we, we hired a company called Sheetal Construction. Um, they did an amazing job. And, and we lived in dust and dirt for the better part of a year. Um, and then this thing just developed, and it was, it's amazing. Every time. How did you feel the day of the opening? Um, it was great. It was, uh, it's, it's, the opening was a big party, and it was a lot of fun. Um, everybody, it, it, it really, um, it's, it's hard to describe. I mean, there was a feeling here that w I, I hadn't f felt in a long time. Um, and it wasn't just members of the shul, it was members of the community also um, participated. It was, op it was an open house, it was during the afternoon. Um, we had a procession where we marched the Torahs from downstairs to upstairs, it was really beautiful. Um, it's hard to describe. The space just works. It's comfortable. It's appropriate. It's not over the top. It's exactly what we needed. And the com and and you know the, the the community and our our members of the congregation um, embraced it. I don't know how I, it, 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 there was a connection between the people and the space. It was absolutely perfect. And nothing was forced, nothing was contrived, it wasn't, oh, look at us, look what we've done. It had nothing to do with that. It was, it was sort of a coming together of, of an effort and a community, um, our community and the rest of the community. And uh, um, it, was, uh, it, was a, it was a beautiful day. Uh, the, it, was, it was also a culmination of things. I mean, you know, you, you, could, you could, this thing was, as it was building, we were building, and you could see it happening. So it wasn't, it was a big reveal. It was a big reveal because no, it was hidden. Nobody really saw it. We kept it hidden uh, behind, uh, you know, behind screens and stuff. But um, it, it, it really was a natural sort of marriage between the community and, and the space and probably was similar to what they experienced uh, when they opened it. Um, I, we see, Wendy, you and I have seen some old pictures of, you know, uh, old videos, I think, when they were building the shul. And, uh, you know, I think it was probably pretty similar to what people experienced back then. A lot smaller scale, obviously, but um, I think I think we, the group, the community, actually did something that that uh, that um, that as a what we we build this as a once in a lifetime opportunity. We didn't have the chance to build this show. Our parents did. Our actually our grandparents did. And um, I, I think that's the other reason why everybody got excited about it because you don't get. This op but that's how we actually went out and raised the money, as you recall. You know, it's a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to do something like this. There's all sorts of good causes 
that we that, that we that we deal with every day, um, and that we're asked to contribute to. But rarely do you get to do something like this, and uh, it was fun. It was great. Um, it's a continuing process for sure. Um, it's never without issues. Uh, we have issues today in terms of how we continue to grow and 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 how we continue to be relevant to the community um, is critical. Um, uh, I, I you know leadership is a is a big is a big issue. Um, one of the things that building a place like this and rejuvenating a community um, a, a allows to happen is that other people step up, and we were lucky. You know. Um, we had a uh, we have a great uh, team that came in, in after us and was able to carry on with uh, you know with with Ira and Cindy and um, um, you know and I think you know from here on other people too will step in and continue to build. I do think the one big area that we still have to deal with, and I this is my own personal view. I don't know if it's reflected, but you know education is so important uh, with the kids. Um, that's the heart and soul of the community, and <clears throat> and we have to make that available on a um, um, on a concerted effort from a community base. Because as people come to this community, they have to have options. There has to be three strong synagogues, which we have, and there has to be alternate uh, educational facilities, in my view, to, because not everybody fits into one mold, and and you have to be. You have to make it available, and I think there's a lot of work that we need to do still in that regard, for the embetterment of all of the community and all of our synagogues. Um, you know, 30 some odd years ago, when my kids were young, um, you know, there were limited options as to what we could put our kids in for a Jewish education, and unfortunately, the same thing I think still exists today. So I think I think I think that's where some effort needs to be. Place in terms of the future, but the good news is now we have facilities to do that, and and it's all a process. So build. What do you say? From strength to strength, or you build on building blocks, and I think that's that's what we were able to do.